pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So you all have the minutes. Are there any changes to the minutes? Or could I have a motion to approve them? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Maria. On the first page, um, when it was said that there was a great turnout at the Delaware County Suicide Prevention, I, that is to read great Radnor turnout, roughly 50 people from Radnor. I do not know the total number that were there for Delaware County, so I didn't want that to be thinking only 50 people came, if that matters to anyone. And <clears throat> in the last sentence regarding the Dr. Offit on the next page, uh, referring to hotlines, the last sentence, um, because they were often not accurate and the the person on the other end only had 30 minutes of training for the students, not 30 minutes for the children. That's very different. So the people that answered the phone only had 30 minutes of training on that subject matter. That's it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for making those corrections. So with those uh, amendments, are there any other amendments? No? Could I have a move to adopt them as amended? Move to approve the minutes. And a second? I'll, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Very good. Um, the health officer's report, uh, Larry Teltone has a um, has another meeting that he had to be at which he had to be. So um, just briefly, he did nine food inspections, 20 bathing place inspections, 10 complaints. Uh, various animals were tested and fortunately found negative for rabies, although as we know, rabies is in our community, one near drowning in a swimming pool and various other issues. A couple of things he particularly wanted to mention, upcoming June 23rd, the Wayne Senior Center, adult traffic safety program, seatbelt and pedestrian safety with Street Smart starting at 1045 a.m. And June 30th, 2014, Wayne Senior Center also, car fit event sponsored by AA the A and the AARP and the American Occupational Therapy Association. I don't see a time on that, although there was a handout somewhere here. Car fit 130 to 330 on Monday, June 30th at the Wayne Senior Center. So for these, if you would call Marsha Cook at 610-688-6246 or just look at the Radnor Township website. Um, and one other thing he wanted me to mention is that we will be seeing uh, billboards about West Nile virus, um, Maureen Hennessy, uh, from the Delaware County government. They obtained some special funding, so there will be billboards reminding people to not have standing water or get rid of standing water on their property because with all the rain we've had, they do expect, a, unfortunately, a banner year for West Nile in our community. So um, I'm going to go a little bit out of order so that we can have uh, Kelsey Durr do a presentation for us first on, and she is a Radnor High School graduate of a couple years ago and now is a junior at George Mason and is interning, her major is sports management, and so she's interning at Radnor Township Recreation and Community Programming Department, and she's going to give us a overview of the recreation opportunities available in Radnor Township for children of all ages. Thank you, Amy. In order to fundamentally expand my opportunities and experiences as I further educate my, my, as I further my education outside of my classroom as an intern here for the Radnor Township Parks and Recreation Program, it was brought to my attention that I speak this evening on behalf of the Recreation Department in order to alert others about the Radnor community has to offer. 
As a department, the mission here is to bring people of the Radnor community together as there are a wide variety of activities for families of Radnor and families throughout the surrounding areas to enjoy. Not only do we arrange for outdoor activities, but the resources to enjoy living. What's great about Radnor, its recreation department specifically, is that we do not focus on the sport of recreation, but very much on the idea of residents getting outside and enjoying what the community of Radnor Township has to provide. Within Radnor Township alone, there are 23 parks spread over the 13.8 square miles of our community encompass encompasses. And as you can see, there's a, a, like 16, I guess, different parks here located on the screen. And you can definitely see that there's different um, entities that each involves, and they're very much so different. Um, some of these include nature trails, dog parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, picnic areas, rivers and streams, bathrooms, and water fountains. But they all embrace the notion of what rec recreation actually means, which is, and I quote from dictionary.com, the refreshment of health or spirits by relaxation and enjoyment. As a recreation department for Radnor Township, we strive to provide the community members with numerous activities and programs, including our parks and facilities, as they are focused and geared toward the concept of recreation. Not only does Radnor offer an array of parks, but as a community programming department, our programs include birthday parties year-round for Radnor at the Radnor Activity Center, different summer camps, our big summer camp is Radnor Day Camp, and, spring, and preschool camp which has been around now for 73 years and counting. But not the only camp for residents and non-residents of Radnor. Some others include Harry Potter camps, youth theater camps, several nature and outdoors camps, different sports clinics, and even adult programs. Through the recreation department, anyone can also pick up discounted tickets to their favorite amusement parks, zoo, or even the movies. Some of our seasonal events include Santa's delivery, a truck zoo, Pumpkin Patch Event, Daddy Daughter Dance, Trout Derby, Wheels of Wayne, Trunk or Treat, and the annual Penn Medicine Radnor Run, all held right here in Radnor Township. And here are just a few pictures as well from some of the events. We've had a great turnout so far. The one picture in the middle of the pumpkin patch, they actually just received an award for innovation of uh, involving the recreation department because they actually got a helicopter to fly over and drop a bunch of candies so kids would run around and pick up the candies from the sky. So that was kind of neat. Um, by logging onto the website and visiting radnor.com or more specifically radnorrecreation.com is where our latest and most recently updated information can be found. Through the website, visitors can also find information regarding their own well-being and healthy tips that can be located in our Live Well, Play Well, Be Well link. This is where we update and put out new information regarding health tips, recipes, recreation ideas, and other important information to help everyone live a more active, balanced lifestyle. In fact, we are planning on launching a new segment to the Live Well, Play Well, Be Well page concerning concussion awareness per the CDC on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services. We hope to provide our residents with as much information and resources to lead a better, healthier, and happier life. As the summer rolls around and we are gearing up for these specific programs, this summer we're going to have our Great American Backyard Campout, which will be an overnight stay at the Willows. And families are welcome to pitch a tent, learn how to start a fire, and it's uh, the Radnor Boy Scouts and Club Scouts pre uh, present it. So that'll be a fun one. We also have the night at the ballpark held over here in Anki Field, where we'll be playing um, a live game, the Phillies versus the Milwaukee Brewers this year. And there's going to be fireworks at the end of the night, and it'll be a fun activity to bring the whole family to and enjoy an evening of baseball and fun dunk takes. Uh, different vendors come out, and it'll be a fun time. We also have Shakespeare in the Park, which is held at the Willows, and they'll be showing a live play of the Twelfth Night, and that's at the Willows Park, a beautiful scenery there. And lastly, we have three summer concert series this, this summer. These are all free events, and there's going to be a children's concert, a classic rock concert, and a popular rock concert as well, all held at various parks within Radnor. For more information, you can check out our Radnor Activities Guide, and you can check out our website, radnorrecreation.com, or you can stop by in our office, which is located in this building on the opposite side of the wall. Thank you. Thank you for your time.
It was great, Kelsey. A lot of things I didn't know. Um, I was just curious if there was anything since you've been doing this that's particularly surprising to you. Because I know you grew up in this township, right? So yes. that's a great um, question. Because honestly, I've been living in Radnor for 13 years now, and I didn't know the extent of how many programs are offered, or even that I actually went down to the archives in the basement, and they have. The Suburban Times dated back to the 1920s, and I actually flipped through and found a couple of articles that said that like the Radnor Dane Camp was 35 years and counting, and now we're at 75 years now. So it's pretty crazy, and just everything that we have to offer. A lot of these, a lot of these programs are free, but some of them, like the summer camps, you have to sign up for and pay for them, obviously, because there's a lot of outside acti activities that they bring in to the kids. But that's what surprised me the, no the most was the amount of activities that we actually offer here and the amount of parks there are some parks that I haven't even been to and we're actually doing a program this summer or we're going to keep it going it's called passport to parks where we're actually going to post a picture a discrete picture so people have to go to the park and find the picture and explore and find parks that they wouldn't normally go to and so that'll be a fun one that we're working on this summer Perfect. thanks does anybody else have any questions Amy Leader, you were going to do the, some, the camp out, right? Yeah. I'll be there. It'll be fun. Yes. It'll be a fun time. <laughs> Glad to hear. And the Radnor um, bus trip to the U.S. Open tennis is yes. always a great event. Mm -hmm. We actually just sent out our letters back to people who will be returning, I guess. Yes. And um, a couple of people have signed up already. Are you going to make it out to that? I hope so. <laughs> My third or fourth year, it's a great time, and yeah. it's a great deal. And it's cool that we provide the services to get people in the community of Radnor to come together and go to the US Open as a community and represent Radnor. You know? Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is, have, did the, did they, uh, are you, I mean, how unusual is it that they have an intern? Or? Um, I don't know if they're constantly looking for interns, but I got very lucky, especially because I'm very familiar with this area. So it's really awesome that I get to earn credit for this towards my degree and get a great experience outside of the classroom, which is really awesome. It's what I look forward to the best. Great. Well, thank you very much for staying late today and uh, updating us and the public on all these uh, great things. So thank you very thank much, you. Kelsey. Hope to see you guys out. Sign up <laughs> for camps. And I'll just mention one other thing along these lines. Um, you know, there's also a concert series um, in Bryn Mawr in the, you know, at the gazebo there. So I went last Saturday and, uh, you know, I mean, that one costs, but uh, most of them are free. And, um, you know, so that's part of the Lower Marion thing, which, mm -hmm. you know, so yet more activities and outdoor things to do. And we it, have a lot of activities. Yeah. So. Yes. And Kelsey, we just want to wish you good luck Thank in your you so pursuits much. as you finish your schooling and head into your career. It's very nice to see a homegrown working in our township. It's so thank you for all you're problem. doing. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, so, related to the concussions, Kelsey, you may not realize that concussion stuff actually is stemming from some work that we did as well before, um, but Dr. Foreman, do you want to do the update on concussions in addition to what Kelsey sure. said? Sure. So, uh, emails between uh, Amy and some of the uh, township um, uh, uh, officers on from the school board and also from the township's um, leagues. Uh, has shown that there's uh, a lot of interest in uh, the concussion discussion and to also uh, they've also implemented a number of programs already which are already in place uh, which we sort of knew with the schools uh, but the uh, township uh, leagues have also um, uh, initiated some of the CDC um, information for the coaches to review and and uh, and be familiar with so I think it's great that there's already this um, you know, sort of interest in, in protecting the kids' heads in our community. And uh, I think that will only be great for the future as we uh, have educated coaches and parents so uh, sports become even more safe for our children. So I think it's great. Thank you. Um, Amy, do you want to do your update on HPV? Yeah.
did she get that up there? Oh, whoop, whoop, there we go. There we go. Okay, let me go down there. Okay, so uh, Amy had asked me to give a little quick update on the status of HPV vaccination, um, and I was trying to get some information locally about the main line area, and I still couldn't find that. I don't, I don't know if you have anything, but I reached out to Mainline Health, and they didn't even have it pulled together in a way that they could share with me. So, um, but I do have some things sort of nationally and statewide and, and Philadelphia that we can we can just look at here. Uh, let's see. So I, I would imagine that everyone is familiar with HPV. It's the human papillomavirus. It's the primary cause of cervical cancer and other cancers in males and females. The most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. Is that in a little bit? More, is that better? Can you hear me? More than six million new cases a year. Um, relatively still unknown in the general public when I go out and do a lot of different research and projects and you ask um, adults or teens or parents or anyone to name sexually transmitted infections. They always say HIV, herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, you know, they name this long list and they never say HPV. So despite it being the most common sexually transmitted infection, it's still not uh, at the top of everyone's head. Here's a list of the things that it is known to cause. Of course, cervical cancer is the one we're most familiar with, as well as genital warts, but it also has some um, implications in other cancers, head and neck cancers. Um, and there's also been some research around melanin's links to melanoma, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. So I think as this field evolves, we'll get a better understanding of, of everywhere it's present. Um, cervical cancer is the tip of the iceberg, so we have about 10,000 cases of cervical cancer each year in the U.S., and those at the bottom is the 6 million or so HPV infections, and in the middle you have um, some of these um, cervical infections and things like that, the low-grade cell and the high-grade cell, and um, you know, as it rises you just see sort of this little group of cervical cancer, but there's all these people at the bottom who have either HPV infection or some kind of um, cytological abnormality there. Uh, rates of HPV infection remain highest uh, in the younger age groups, uh, 14 to 19 and 20, then 20 to 24, um, which then has implications for the reason that we vaccinate the younger ones. Um, because it's linked as a sexually transmitted infection, you would expect to see a sort of an age prevalence like that. Um, there are two vaccines against HPV. These have now been out for a while. Uh, they're very similar, except that one is bivalent, the Cervarex, and Gardasil is quadrivalent, so they protect against uh, two or four strains of HPV. I'm not going to go into all those details. You're all a pretty medically savvy audience, so I would imagine you're all pretty familiar with this, but these are the two that are still um, currently licensed on the market. Um, and our recommendations uh, for females and males, the female uh, recommendations went into effect in 2006, so they've been in much longer. The male recommendations went into effect uh, towards the end of 2011. Um, so we now recommend uh, routine use for all 11 to 12 year olds with catch up vaccination range from 13 to 26. Um, the vaccines are licensed from age nine to 26. Um, you can give it to as young as nine, um, often based on parent or provider discretion. Um, it's not uh, a cure for any form of cervical cancer or any kind of dysplasia, um, but you can give it to them to prevent infection of other strains of HPV virus. Um, so how are we doing? This is the part I think that Amy was asking about for the most part. Um, not so well, um, which you're probably aware of in terms of media and things and attention that have, have been uh, out for a while. Um, so this is data relative, this is 2013 data, this is some of the more recent data that's come out of CDC. You can see HPV vaccination rates for males and females are much lower than some of the common other um, adolescent vaccines that we would consider the, the Tdap and the meningococcal. So uh, we are not doing well by any stretch of the means. Although as a city, um, we're doing better. So if you look at the US and Philadelphia, that's one dose, and then the US um, and uh, Philadelphia for all three, um, you can see that Philadelphia is, is higher. Um, these, the first, these are female rates. Um, Philadelphia has higher rates than the state of Pennsylvania overall, and the state of Pennsylvania has higher rates than the country overall. So um, we are doing better than our peers, um, although when you, you know, plot it against the healthy people goals for some of the other common adolescents, we again fall very short. Um, and Amy had reminded me of some data today for the males, which are doing um, equally not well. So, uh, but their rates are in the single digits. Um, again, but the males in Philadelphia are, seem to have higher vaccination rates than the rest of the males in Pennsylvania who then have higher rates than the rest of the males in the country. 
Um, so this is a sort of a map of the country, and you can see vaccination completion rates across the country. Um, as a state, we, we do pretty well, as I was mentioning. You can see there are other states doing much worse than us. Um, Delaware and Rhode Island, I think, are the, two, the top two states. That one up there is Rhode Island. Um, but we're not far behind. So as a state, we're not, we're not that far off. People ask me these questions about the mandates and whatever happened to all that school mandate stuff we were talking about that was in the news for so long and I, we wanted to mandate in all these different states. So, f so <clears throat> this is a, a map here of legislation introduced, legislation enacted, and then executive order. So there are handfuls of states, and you can see them here, that either have had legislation introduced or legislation enacted. And the legislation that's been introduced and enacted is mostly things like um, we'll provide educational information to parents. It's not mandates. The only two places where there's mandates in the country are Virginia and D.C. Um, and the opt-out policies are very easy to get out of. Um, particularly in Virginia, you don't need a form, you don't need to sign anything, you just sort of say, no, thank you, and they don't really track the data. So um, the mandates, things have seemed to really subsided for the most part. Um, let's see what else. So this is just a two or three slides about sort of the state of the art and or state of the science in the literature about vaccine acceptability. Um, so despite the benefits of having this vaccine available, acceptance rate don't don't match anywhere close to uh, the availability of it. So there are provider barriers. Um, some of them are, you know, you need to get the teens in for a medical visit. We know that teenagers and adolescents are some are the least likely to come in for our routine visits compared to little kids who need lots of vaccines. So it's just harder to find them and see them. It's a three-shot series, so you need to get them to come back. Um, some providers just will say that they're not well versed in the HPV vaccine, and particularly more rural providers don't feel that they've been given as much information, and so there's a lack of knowledge. They don't really want to have discussions with parents about sex. They're hesitant. They don't know what their feelings about the vaccine are, so they avoid the topic in general. Um, there's barriers on parent side. Again, just lack of knowledge about HPV. As I was saying, if you ask a group of parents to name every STI or STD that they can think of, they hardly ever say HPV. Um, there's still con lingering concerns about vaccine safety and efficacy, even though it's been around for a, a while, uh, not as long as the others, but it's been around for a while now. Um, and there are articles showing that the side effects are not serious in, in ways. Um, and then there was this idea that vaccination condones sex in some way. Um, and then there's these pragmatic barriers, you know, multiple visits, you're paying, if you have to come in for co-pays over time or you have lots of kids and you have a low-income family and it's just a lot of extra visits and some co-pays, so there's some of those issues as well. Um, so summing it all up in a few minute presentation, it's an important preventive health advancement for both males and females. Um, oh, I forgot the V there. Adolescents are at high risk of HPV but are not widely using the vaccine compared to the other adolescent vaccines we have. Um, most are not completing the full series, so you'll see a lot of them will start the series and not go all the way through the three. Um, and then disparities in vaccination will eventually perpetrate disparities in disease because the ones who need to be vaccinated the most are the least likely to get it. Um, and I put this last because this came out, it came out in February, um, but it's re still relatively new. This is the President's Cancer Panel, Cancer Panel released this report to the President of the United States about HPV vaccination uptake. So um, goals about increasing uptake in our country, um, reducing missed clinical appointments, increasing parent and adolescent acceptance of the vaccine, maximizing access to the vaccine services, and then promoting it globally as well, uh, where cervical cancer remains a huge disease burden overall. Um, so that report is available online. It's free. It's downloadable. You just Google it and you can find it. That's all. That was HPV in five to ten minutes or less. <laughs> and what is the work that you specifically are doing? So I do mostly um, community-based interventions around HPV vaccination, mostly in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and so I've done some work um, in with parents and children in community settings and rec centers. I've done a beauty salon project where I worked with hair salon stylists and their customers, um, things like that. Um, and I also do some data analysis. Some of the CDC data that came through the Philadelphia School District, um, we worked on some of the data analysis with that project as well. So from, some, from your experience, yeah. what do you feel like would be some of the important things to do? I think it's still, you know, it's still a matter of awareness in a lot of sense. You know, you just find these pockets of parents and adolescents who have just not heard about it, despite it being around for a while. And you would think the media and all sorts of things, there are people who are just not aware of it, or they confuse it with herpes or HIV or hep C or all. It's just, for some pockets of people, once you do some basic education, like, oh, yeah, 
yeah, okay, that's a good idea. So and I link it, I always link it to cervical cancer prevention. You know, they say I work in a cancer center. Cervical cancer is painful. You, know, you don't want anyone to go through that. Amy, um, I was wondering if yeah. you would be willing yeah. to send this slide presentation to Dr. Offit so that she could take sure. some yeah, absolutely. of the educational pieces absolutely. from there for her site because possibly if we get to the young people. Yeah, to the teens, yeah. That, because I know it's taught in the health classrooms, yeah. but that may not transfer all the way to Absolutely. home, or maybe they didn't, yeah. you know, they were younger, yeah. you know. So, and I do think the other piece, which is, has always concerned me, mm -hmm. but I think the biggest reluctance is the whole issue of sexuality. And condoning, you know, that there is this issue if, I vaccinate my child, and then does that make, that's, yeah. oh, I remember when this first came out, yes. I had parents yeah. banging down the door, does this mean, you know, and yeah. if you have a boy and a girl, do you get the yeah. girl done and not the boy? And yeah. so until parents become comfortable with yeah. sexuality yeah. and discussing it with their children, I think yeah. we're going to have this yeah. issue. But I, if, if you're comfortable with that, oh, absolutely. I'll yeah, give you course. her home email yeah, if you, absolutely. and, sure. um, she can, yeah. she may be interested in, uh, yeah, that's fine. thank you we so much. Should. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think when I, with the groups that I work with in Philadelphia, where teen pregnancy rates are so high, the issue of, you know, is my teen going to have sex is just not even, you know, it's just not even a thought anymore because it's just what it is. But I think maybe in Radnor, we may have different discussions than we would have in some sections of Philadelphia. Yeah, but I'd be happy to share it and we can pass it on. Yeah. Did you have something? Good. Um, yeah, I mean, the data are quite good that the getting immunized with this vaccine mm -hmm. neither uh, relates to earlier sex or sex with more partners. Mm -hmm. um, those data are quite good. I just wanted to say uh, one thing about the term mandates. I mean, one of the issues with this vaccine is that, <coughs> excuse me, it's not generally uh, made it into the school immunization requirements. <coughs> excuse me. Because it's not a disease that would thought to be normally transmitted right. during school as mm -hmm. other sort of respiratory yeah. diseases are. So that's been an obstacle. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, a lot of times um, school nurses, when they're sending things home to the parents or they're, um, um, you know, putting out newsletters, they'll say these are the immunizations which required mm -hmm. for school entry or attendance, and they're not including mm -hmm. those vaccines, including HPV that are not required for school, but that are part of the CDC and the American Academy of mm -hmm. Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians routine recommendations for children. So trying to get school nurses yeah. to be part of the educational yeah. effort for this is something that in some of the immunization coalitions with which I mm -hmm. work, we're doing that. And just one other thing I want to say is that Pennsylvania is unique among the states in having a big city pull up the immunization rates for the whole state. I mean, Philadelphia, yeah. their um, immunization uh, unit in the Division of Disease Control and Prevention is just outstanding, and they just mm -hmm. really have their act together, and they pull up our immunization rates as a state for every single vaccine. Yeah. And they're, you know, they've been recognized mm -hmm. nationally by the CDC for their work yeah. um, with varicella, with measles. Yeah. Um, they're just, uh, you know, their immunization yeah. registry, they have, you know, mm -hmm. virtually 100% private provider participation mm -hmm. because of the way they run it. So yeah. um, we're, you we're know, lucky to have we have yeah. this national model, you yeah. know, right, right, right here, here in our state. Yeah. And it's unique. I mean, every other yeah. state, the big cities pull down yeah. the immunization rates. Yeah. So it's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we get to uh, Dr. Nana's presentation, there's one thing I wanted to bring up. I went to an excellent presentation on distracted driving that was Tuesday, May 20th, and it was um, the, because it was such a great presentation, and the parents, um, you know, this, they have a end distracted driving or nddd.org uh, website, and they, not, you know, not unlike some people who get involved in this kind of activity, have a personal story of their daughter being 
uh, killed by a distracted driver. And in the course of working with many other people who've had that experience and also with people who have injured or killed somebody because of their distracted driving and the trauma that they experience, you know, they've sort of dedicated themselves to this issue. And um, there, there was uh, the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey came out with the 2013 data, and in that they talk about how smoking rates are down, um, uh, smokeless tobacco is up slightly, but not as high as it had been, and um, so, you know, on the one hand, and TV watching is down, although, of course, as we know, there's other kinds of, uh, you know, electronic and often sedentary behavior replacing some of TV, but, um, and uh, fighting actually is down and alcohol use is down. And yet this is, um, you know, these issues are still where our health curriculum is. And when, because I, I had emailed um, uh, Mark Skellinger, the principal of the high school, about you know distracted driving and getting this program in, and he said, "Well, we offer it, meaning we offer it in May in an, an evening, and that that was sort of adequate." And yet, distracted driving is one of those health behaviors that is really risky and that is really on the increase. And so, this kind of general. So, I would I've been trying to find and and uh, Mr. Kane, I'm hoping to get your help with this at time. Uh, you know, I assume it'll, at this point it'll be in the fall, although maybe they meet over the summer, what, to meet with the health educators to sort of find out more about how they, cons how they decide what they're teaching and, um, you know, it, does the curriculum have the ability to sort of flex when we have data like this that say, well, some of the things that we're really concentrating on, we're doing a great job, we need to keep it up, but there's this other, you know, this whole other risk behavior that is really serious and that we need to be including. And one of the things about this NDD.org is they have slide sets with speakers' notes. They have, as well as speakers, I mean, they have tremendous resources that can be adopted very, very easily. Um, and, you know, the, the program I went to, you know, there were fewer than 20 people there. I mean, it's a May evening. People are very busy, you know, with, uh, you know, and sports and graduations and et cetera. So, I, I don't view that as adequate to address the issue, and I think it is a very significant issue, and uh, for adults as well as as uh, kids. And here we have, you know, this national resource that just happens to be right in our area, um, as well as the online resources. So, I'm hoping that, um, you know, I, I don't know if the health educators meet as a group or. Maybe you could help me out with this, but and sort of the kind of general, I feel like in general, I would like the Board of Health to be better connected with them because maybe there are things that we could be doing to help publicize that they see and vice versa what we're learning and we would like, you know, to have some, um, you know, interaction with them. Well, as Mrs. McCartney can, can attest to, they do meet. Uh, currently, we're in between supervisors. There's a new supervisor that's coming on board at the end of uh, July. Uh, who will be overseeing uh, our health and wellness program uh, and PE. And so uh, what I would encourage is that I'll, I'll ask the person to contact, uh, well, I'll be the contact, uh, to make contact between the, uh, the Board of Health and her uh, regarding uh, these topics. Because certainly uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education has a threshold of health curriculum that needs to be provided. Uh, here at Radnor, we like to, you know, go in all of our curricula, go above the threshold. You know, so certainly I think it'd be something to uh, bring to their attention to let them know that there's a concern. Uh, this aligns itself with our, uh, our concerns regarding uh, mental health and, and other issues in which we're striving to uh, have a more robust curriculum uh, than the state requires. Uh, so certainly there's an opportunity for that. Uh, sadly, until the supervisor comes on board, I really don't know what their schedule is. Uh, I know that uh, Unfortunately, curriculum days are the end of this week as school's winding down, uh, but there is time in the beginning of the school year and there's time throughout the year where uh, teachers get together uh, to talk about curricular issues. So, I mean, this certainly sounds like it's, you know, important for our community and, and that's what we strive to provide, those resources. Okay, so that would be great if you could keep me posted and if there is a time where I find out they're meeting, I can email the board and anybody who is interested um, and available um, you know, it'd be great to have more than, you know, more than just me doing it, obviously. So, um, and as I say, I can see it being useful in a variety of, 
variety of ways and us hopefully being useful to them. So um, that'd be great if you could keep me in mind for that. Thanks. Um, so Dr. Donato, you wanna set up your program? And I guess while he's doing that, are there any um, announcements that people wanted to make or upcoming events? So Dr. I'll Nelson. just chime in just for one sec, if I could, because this is, ties into uh, your uh, concern regarding the e-cigarettes. And the, the board did pass a policy. Uh, it's up for its second reading next week. Uh, so we intend to have that policy in place for the 14-15 uh, school year. So just an update. Terrific. Thank you very much. And for those watching, you meant the school board um, on e-cigarettes, policy on e-cigarettes, okay. And so Dr. Donna is gonna talk about bat white nose syndrome. Just get loaded up here for a moment, okay. One of the reasons for talking about white nose syndrome is that pretty much anybody I ever mention it to, oops, let me just check this here. Okay, so yeah, so pretty much anybody I mention this to, they have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to white nose syndrome. And it's actually a pretty important disease of bats, as you can see there, that um, I think we just need to have a little more information on. And uh, we pretty much get an update on this on ProMed probably about once a week. So it's pretty significant, and we're going to go over a little bit of that. Zoom in there. So white nose syndrome uh, started being noticed in 2007. And what was happening was in upstate New York, there were large die-offs of bats in caves in uh, just such large numbers. It was very impressive. And what was happening was is they were finding all of the bats with white patches on their body, usually in the hairless areas, many times around the nose, giving the name of the disease. And they found it was from a, uh, a fungus that uh, we could just call P. destructans. Uh, it's already gone through a couple permutations of its name, and that's where we are today. And what happens is, with this fungus, is it makes them wake up from hibernation, and they want to search for food, but of course it's not the appropriate time and they end up becoming significantly dehydrated and starving to death. And the, uh, the problem with this disease, and we actually talked about it a little bit in colony collapse disorder, there's a fungus that may play a role. Usually fungi do not cause primary disease. So while we think maybe we have an agent involved, we're not sure that this is the underlying cause of white nose syndrome just happens to be the after effect. And this disease is pretty much going right across North America and we've seen it uh, when it started in New York in 2007, we saw it quickly head to Canada and it's going west each year and south. So now we just got our first report in Mississippi last week so we've had about close to six million bats that have died already in 25 states. So it's going right across the whole United States. And this is what white nose syndrome looks like. You can see here, there's the bat's nose if you need some orientation here, there's ears. <laughs> Sometimes looking at these pictures you can you have to get oriented. But here's, it literally looks like their nose is completely white. And like I say, that part isn't so much of a problem except it wakes them up out of hibernation. So we see a majority of the uh, deaths occurring, you know, right, uh, you know, late winter, uh, early spring. But they can happen at any time. Now the important question is, right, why is this important? And one of the things, of course, is you know, we may end up losing a few species, because in the United States right now, 
it's really having a devastating effect on seven out of the 10 species. So we're really dropping some huge numbers. Um, bats are very important for agriculture. Bats will eat about a ton of insects in an easel. One bat will eat a ton of insects in a season. So a lot of those insects impact our agriculture. And so we are seeing some losses that literally can range anywhere from the 3 billion to 53 billion in losses because of the increase in insects that are attacking the crops. And then, of course, uh, we mentioned earlier about uh, West Nile, and bats do help control mosquito-driven diseases. So one of the problems that everyone's concerned about, of course, is are we going to see an increase in West Nile virus for humans? Um, we, as, as a veterinarian, I've been seeing an uh, uptick in the heartworm disease as well. Now, I don't know if that's directly related, but this past year and a half, we've really seen a, a significant increase, too. So as, uh, but of course, the big one is West Nile that we get worried about. And in fact, uh, there's uh, St. Louis encephalitis virus as well, which is similar to West Nile. That's uh, west of the Mississippi, transmitted pretty similarly. And now that it's making its way west, I wonder if we'll be seeing more of that too. So that didn't show up as well as I would have liked. <laughs> Looks better on my screen. <laughs> so what can we do to help? Well, one of the thoughts is, is that we're tracking some agent when we go into these caves where the bats live from one cave to another, because usually you'll get people who you know, enjoy caving and they, they will go from different uh, caves uh, to another cave. And so the big thing is, is that decontamination afterwards is really important if you are a caver. So that's very important. And that includes clothing and equipment. And then, of course, reporting, uh, that's what this line right here says, is reporting any odd bat behavior. And that's pretty important to do anyway, because bats are a rabies vector species, uh, so they do carry a lot of rabies. But if we want to try and get on a, you know, a little white nose syndrome a little bit early, uh, it's always good that people are sending in reports. Like I say, it's good overall control. And of course, continued research efforts, because I don't know if we're entirely convinced that the fungus is the primary cause. And one of the interesting things is in uh, France, their bats seem to be resistant to this. And the thought is at one point that they had this disease as well and many eons ago, and it wiped out all the bats that were sensitive to it, and the ones that are left have now grown and, uh, and repopulated. But the tough part with this is, is that you know, with bats, they do tend to have a, uh, a very slow uh, reproductive ability because they have generations that actually live for quite some time. And um, they have low birth rates uh, just because they tend to, uh, you know, take care of their young for a little bit. And uh, generally when that happens, your numbers decrease. So, uh, you know, we, we have a, a concern. Uh, like I said, it is affecting agriculture, maybe uh, making more West Nile virus more apparent as well. So just something to be educated on. Any questions on anything white nose syndrome? Do you think this has affected the gnats and all the bugs we've had in our environment? Well, I think there's just more of them because of it, you know, and uh, granted, we don't have any I mean, Pennsylvania has its fair share of caves, there's no doubt, but fortunately we do have a significant bat population that's not so dense here, uh, but, uh, you know, so is it affecting the gnats and all that? Sure, I bet it is. 5.7 million bats are gone, so that's a couple of tons of uh, insects there. Is there, are there any signs yet of, um you know, the bats developing their own resistance or, you know, certain species or, you know, self-corrections self of any kind or not? There are thoughts that maybe in a couple of places the bats are making a little bit of a comeback, but it's so hard to know because, again, their birth rates are so low. We also do see that the bats in the south, so as uh, this past week it hit Mississippi, uh, they don't seem to be as affected as much and generally that's because their hibernation periods are not as long. So 
they're able to, uh, you know, when they wake up from their hibernation, they're able to feed, they're able to do a little bit more than some of the bats up north, like in Canada and, and the northern part of the U.S. Has uh, the USDA shown any interest in uh, bringing in some of the French bats to repopulate? <laughs> no green cards. I haven't read any. Yeah, right. That'll, that'll go perfectly well, yeah. Um, I haven't heard anything about that yet. It's sort of interesting to think that, that if that's a resistance strain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I worry too about um, the agriculture, like if it's affecting crops and then we're spraying a pesticides on our food supply is worrisome right. to me. That's what I see, the trickle down effect. Well, right, and are we taking out more of the bees then with the increased use of, you know, some of the pesticides? You know, that's a concern as well. So yeah, it really is a, is a significant problem. So I have a, this might be naive, but you're saying the, the bats that live in the south that wake up early are, are able to do well, better, because there's something for them to eat. So if we find them, are we able to treat them in any way? I mean, they you seem know. to be living with it. Is there something we can do about them? They're still having die-offs there. And like I say, they literally just hit this past week, so I'm not sure we know all that much about it yet. But the, um, you know, as far as treating a fungus, that is a very expensive thing to do and a very individualized thing. It's not like we could just spray something and it'll kill all the fungi, which um, that's, that's a very difficult proposition. And unfortunately, yes, you can treat individual bats, but, and that again, maybe we're just treating the surface. Who knows what's happening underneath? So it's tricky. Good. Anything else? Question wise? Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. And I just appreciate so much the, you know, diversity of expertise on the board. I mean, I think everyone has been um, really, you know, stepping up with presentations on different issues and interests and, you know, different things. And it's just really warms my heart. It's wonderful. <laughs> it does. Um, any further uh, new business or things that people would like to see? I know one thing coming up um, in the fall, I was contacted by someone who wants to talk about both the uh, provision of and availability for help with respite care in the township. And so she'll be uh, hopefully in September. Um, so I have her kind of on the agenda. Um, any other new business or things that you would like to see on the agenda for the fall? No? Um, and Morgan, I just want to thank you for all your work and I think we'll be seeing, um, I, th I think you want to wait and see what your interest is or is not for the fall, but um, thank you for all that you've done for us for this past year, thank you. Um, so if there is no, if there is nothing further, then I will just remind everyone that our next meeting is Monday, September 15th at five o'clock here. And uh, just hope everyone has a happy and healthy and safe summer. And um, so I'm, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. <laughs>